Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Beatrice. I'm a, P a PhD student at Purdue University. Uh, I'm here with Fabrizio, who is a PhD student at Imperial College London. And uh, we are going to present our paper, Understanding and Extending Subgraph GNNs by Rethinking Their Symmetries, which is a collaboration with uh, Michael Bronstein and Agai Maron. And the paper was just uh, recently selected to be an oral uh, presentation at New Rips 2022. So I'm going to start and then uh, Fabrizio is going to continue at a certain point, but uh, you can definitely interrupt us uh, anytime you would like. We are happy to discuss, uh, take any question or clarification we might, we might give. So just uh, to start- sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt Beatrice, but do you mind uh, putting your browser in full screen? Um, I oh. think- uh, I think with F11 or something, uh, maybe you can put the. Uh, is that you know, amazing? like you are right, but I think um, how do I do this? Um, you know, I think it is um, maybe because of Zoom. I can join from the browser. Let me try. Uh, or I think okay. Then in the meantime, uh, Fabrizio, how did you how did you go from from Isan to to this? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm happy to give a small insight at the beginning. So essentially, um, yeah, we worked on the first paper, which uh, goes into like year last year, and the idea was to really formalize this intuition of. Um, processing a graph, not as a set of uh, interconnected nodes, but as a set of subgraphs from the same graph. And uh, we try to, you know, formalize this whole idea and study the expressive power of these approaches. Uh, and we thought we had a model which was the most general possible. Uh, but then uh, concurrently, uh, a lot of um, uh, works appeared and we realized that on one end, uh, these works were sometimes um, you know, specific uh, instantiations of Fadison, but in other occasions there were like, um, there were some, some slight uh, differences in uh, uh, or peculiarities in the layer equations, which we could not really uh, substitute with this. And so we had the, the intuition that there might be something more. Uh, and in an effort to try and unify this, all these methods, uh, we uh, realized that in some cases, when you use some specific strategies to select subgraphs, you can um, uh, make stronger assumptions uh, on the form of the, of the layers. And this was the idea behind them, this, the old development of the new work, which allowed us to focus on a specific family uh, of uh, the subgraph methods, and unify them under this common framework, essentially. Uh, this is the spoiler. <laughs> yeah. Then let's it's... look at this common framework. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. OK. Um, and can you see my screen, right? And it's full screen now. OK. Thanks. Um, so uh, yeah, please like uh, ask questions uh, as we proceed if you have any. So just to start, uh, I'm going to introduce some notation by briefly recapping what we are going to talk about and some prior knowledge that um, we all have. So we are going to say that we are going to talk about uh, graph neural networks or GNNs, which are functions of the form that it is uh, shown here taking as input attributed graphs and returning as output a representation of uh, the input graph in some high dimensional space. Uh, arguably, the most popular form of GNNs are message passing neural networks or MPNNs, which uh, consist of uh, multiple message passing layers followed by a readout function that produce uh, a final graph representation. These uh, message passing layers are responsible of updating the representation of the nodes. And the representation of a certain node i at a layer L plus one is obtained uh, via an update function that takes as input uh, the representation of the node at uh, the previous layer 
and the aggregation of the messages uh, coming from the neighbors of high. As we know, uh, graphs can be represented by making use of uh, adjacency matrices, uh, and we call the adjacency matrix of a graph A, wh where we store whether two nodes are connected by an edge, and uh, also the uh, matrix feature, the feature matrix, which uh, contain for each node uh, its feature or color in the case uh, shown, uh, shown here. Without loss of generality, these two matrices can be fused together, yielding a matrix representation of the graph where off diagonal terms uh, contain the connectivity and uh, on diagonal terms are used to store the features of the nodes. We say that uh, two graphs are isomorphic if uh, there exists an adjacency preserving bijection between the two, which in practice means that we will have different matrix representations for uh, graphs that are isomorphic. This means that uh, our desiderata become giving the same representation to uh, isomorphic graph, graphs as they indeed encode the same structures and distinct representations to graphs that are non-isomorphic as we want to potentially disambiguate them. However, um, when, when uh, using these message passing neural networks, we are going to have uh, some, some problem with this because message passing neural networks are in general advantages as they are uh, local, which means that they, taint, they take into account the existing, uh, the existing co connectivity when propagating messages. They're also scalable. And uh, finally, they're invariant to permutation of the node IDs, which means that they intrinsically satisfy uh, one of our desiderata as they give uh, the same representation to uh, isomorphic graphs. Um, but no matter how they are parameterized, they are, they are not going to give different representations uh, to all the non-isomorphic graphs. Um, as, uh, it is, um, uh, as it is shown here, where we have uh, two distinct graphs, uh, which are definitely not non-isomorphic, non and uh, in this case uh, represent two different molecules. Uh, that uh, are not going to be given uh, different representations by a message passing neural network, which means that they are not going to be distinguished by a message passing neural network. And uh, this, uh, this is because the expressive power of message passing neural networks is bounded by the WL heuristic or WL test, which is a well-known uh, combinatorial heuristic used in graph theory to check whether two graphs are isomorphic. It works by first assigning the same initial color to all the nodes and then updating the color of a node B using an hash function that takes as input the previous color of the nodes, which is CB, and then the multiset of the colors of, uh, of uh, its neighbors. This is done iteratively. So we are going to update the representation of nodes. And at the end, we obtain a graph representation in the form of an histogram, which contain the number of nodes that have a certain color. The WL test is a necessary but insufficient condition for graph isomorphism, which means that if two graphs get, di get different histograms, they are non-isomorphic, but the contrary is not true. And therefore, if we are going to be given the same histogram, like we, we cannot tell for sure that the two graphs are, um, are uh, isomorphic. The WL heuristic iteratively updates the representation of each node. And for this reason, it's also called 1WL, since indeed it considers one node at a time. There exist higher order counterparts of the WL test, which uh, uh, form a, a high hierarchy with KWL considering instead of a single node, a tuple of K nodes. The concept, the concept of uh, neighbors uh, of a tuple is obviously different than the concept of neighbors of a node, but understanding the details is out of the scope of, uh, of this talk. The important part is that uh, we talk about a hierarchy because uh, all the pairs of non-isomorphic graphs that are distinguishable by KWL are also distinguishable by K plus one WL, but the contrary is not true. And therefore, like there is this strict inclusion between the, the spaces as it is shown by the diagrams here. And there exists work that tries to break this expressivity limit of message passing neural network. Uh, 
uh, and uh, it, we group them into different categories. In the first line of work, which is what we call higher order GNNs, we have uh, the methods that take inspiration by the KWL hierarchy to design some models that are increasingly expressive uh, uh, with K. These methods are non-local as they do not retain or use the original graph connectivity, which result in uh, dense computations and they are computationally intractable for K that is uh, greater or equal than three. Another line of work proposes adding uh, identifiers, unique identifiers to the nodes of the graph. Uh, while they maintain the local computation of message passing neural networks, they have the advantage that uh, every node can uniquely identify all the others thanks to this uh, unique ID that is added. They are related to, to local, which is a computational model for distributed computing, which has been proven to be uh, Turing complete under certain assumptions. However, uh, these methods are not invariant to permutation of the node IDs. And uh, they, this also results in, uh, in practical difficult, difficulties in generalization. And this can be seen intuitively because um, uh, a certain graph so... is going to, yeah. Hello? No, okay, sorry. I think there was just me. Um, I thought the connection was bad, but probably it's just mine. Sorry, go, go on. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so um, what I wanted to say is that uh, in practice, they have difficulties in generalization because as you can intuitively uh, see, uh, like a, a certain graph is going to be given uh, different, um, potentially different identifiers uh, in train and in test, if it is seen uh, again in test. And it is hard for the network to understand that it is indeed the, the exactly same graph that it is seen in, uh, in train. Other methods propose uh, the usage of uh, substructures, either to guide the message passing or uh, by injecting this information uh, in the message passing before the message passing step. They are sparse and equivariant, but uh, some form of domain knowledge is required to choose which uh, substructures to use. Finally, uh, subgraph GNNs are uh, um, a recent family of methods which feature sparsity and uh, equivariance while also being uh, domain agnostic. And uh, they have been recently proposed by several concurrent works, but this area still remains uh, la largely underexplored. And uh, related to this, we have actually presented our uh, equivalent subgraph aggregation uh, networks uh, or ESAN uh, work exactly here in this uh, reading group last year. And uh, this is one of the subgraph GNN methods that I was referring uh, just in the previous slide. We are going to do a recap of the intuition behind this approach and all the other subgraph GNNs and which is an intuition that it is indeed shared between different methods, which we are also going to introduce. And after that, we are going to focus on the fact that these methods are still underexplored and we want to find a characterization and study them. So what's the intuition? So even if some graphs that are non-isomorphic are WL equivalent as the two ones that are shown here, they may contain subgraphs that are instead distinguishable by the WL test. This means that uh, the idea is to use a bag of subgraphs to gain inexpressive power. And these uh, subgraph GNNs will be um, composed by a subgraph selection policy, which will be responsible of creating this bag of subgraphs given an input graph. The policies must be easy to compute and domain agnostic because we want to maintain the advantages of subgraph GNNs, which are being tractable at least to some extent and also being domain agnostic. The policies that are usually considered are node deletion, node marking, edge deletion, egonets, marked egonets, or like something like this, which are, for example, the node deletion policy, 
where uh, each subgraph is created by deleting one node uh, from uh, the original graph. The other component of a subgraph GNN is uh, an encoder, which uh, we need to design um, in, uh, in a way that uh, it processes uh, bag of subgraph in a principal uh, manner, which is an aspect that has been studied in different uh, works. In particular, the SGNN is uh, one of the architecture that uh, we proposed in our uh, ESAN work. The subgraph selection policy is uh, mm, that we studied where no deletion, edge deletion, egonets, and marked egonets. And uh, the encoder is simple, where each subgraph is uh, processed independently by a stack of message passing layers. In the equation that is uh, shown here, uh, we update the node representation in subgraph I by means of, um, of uh, message passing layers using the connectivity of subgraph I, which is stored in AI, which is like the adjacency of the subgraph I, and the previous features that are uh, in XI. Note that all the subgraphs are processed, in, uh, are processed by the same message passing layers with the same parameters. And these layers are therefore like CME's components. OK, but um, can we have a quick question by Omar? Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I have a question regarding these uh, subgraph selection policies. So it seems like the, the space of possible policies is pretty enormous. So I, I'm, I'm just curious if you if you've thought about learning these policies in any way. Uh, there is a recent work that tries to learn uh, the policy. Um, in uh, general, uh, it's um, like, it's a valid, uh, it's obviously, something that can be beneficial, but uh, back propagating uh, to choose the, um, the policies, uh, it's non-trivial, right? Because you need to choose like which edge to retain or which node. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting question. It's, it was out of the scope of these uh, subgraph GNNs that uh, we are going to present here because uh, they usually consider a fixed uh, policy that are very simple, so still domain agnostic, but not learned. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you for the question, by the way. And uh, OK, this was uh, the SGNN. And uh, the second architecture that we considered uh, in our ESAN work was uh, the SSGNN which still consider, uh, considers the same subgraph selection policies to create the bag of subgraph. But the encoder is composed uh, not only by the CME's component uh, that was uh, um, also present before, but it also contains an additional term. The idea is that a node in a subgraph can be traced back to the node uh, in the original graph, which means that nodes are aligned across the subgraphs. This allows to construct an aggregation of the subgraphs, which we call AUG and XUG. And then we can perform message passing with different parameters on the aggregation of these uh, subgraphs. In like more precisely, the node representations of subgraph I are obtained by summing the result of the message passing, which is applied to each subgraph independently with uh, the result obtained by the message passing that is applied on the aggregation of uh, the subgraphs. A concurrent work, even if uh, it sparkles from a different motivation, is uh, Reconstruction GNN, which uh, um, considered the same encoder uh, as uh, DSGNN, so an encoder that coincides with that. But uh, it actually uh, studies different policies consisting in uh, deleting tuples uh, of nodes uh, in order to gain an expressive power and construct this bag of subgraphs. Nested GNN focused on uh, ego networks. 
and uh, the encoder consists of several uh, layers of message passing with the same parameters uh, without information sharing across subgraphs. And you can see that this is again the same architecture that was uh, uh, also studied in by like with uh, the SGNN. IDGNN works on marked egonets, which are egonets where the root of each subgraph is um, it like is marked, and the, the difference is that it is indeed treated differently. This, uh, like in particular, the layer features a specific uh, message function for the ego network roots, which has a different set of parameters than the message function that it is used for the other neighbors. And for this reason, it's called the heterogeneous message passing. Note that this is the first architecture presented here that it is uh, not obviously subsumed by DSS GNN. So, so it is not clear how they relate to each other and if there is one that is more powerful or, or like uh, which upper bound uh, this architecture has. Finally, uh, GNN as kernel and in particular the context, ve ve uh, the context version that I'm going to present here is another uh, subgraph GNN that has been presented in a, another concurrent work, which uh, consider ego networks as a subgraph selection uh, policy and uh, presents slightly more sophisticated layers. So first, uh, uh, the idea is to do a few rounds of uh, message passing layers, which are again with this uh, light blue color, applied independently on each subgraph. And then after these few rounds, the feature of uh, the ego network's root nodes are updated using the representation after the message passing, which is the first ter term, HII. Then the representation of the subgraph, they are root of. And, and then the representation of the node that is aggregated over all the subgraphs. So to recap, we have seen uh, different methods that belong to this uh, family. They are all uh, uh, tractable, equivariant, and domain agnostic GNNs, which have the uh, advantage of being uh, strictly more expressive than message passing neural networks. However, um, no upper bound on their expressive power is currently known. And it is also not clear whether their layer differences can be reconciled under a common framework. Indeed, like we have seen different methods and it doesn't seem there exists a method that is uh, a method that is capable of subsuming all the others. They are all very similar, but they feature slightly different encoders. So our goal uh, was to study and uh, unify subgraph GNNs, and in particular, a family of these subgraph GNNs that are node-based, that we are going to, um, to introduce in just a minute, how we are going to do so, uh, how to study and unify, by making use of symmetry and uh, equivariance in order to find this common characterization. So I'm going to stop here, and Fabrizio is going to continue. <laughs> It's a good time to ask questions, if any, while I put the slides on. Uh, okay, so we may take a short break. Um, well, Beatrice, you said there's this other paper that learns the uh, um, policy, the subgraph selection policy. So how they do, do they do it? Some reinforcement learning stuff? Or... No, it's actually uh, through um, implicit MLE. I, I'm going okay. to send you the paper. Yeah. But uh, the reinforcement uh, learning uh, approaches could also be possible. I don't think this has been studied yet. In, yeah, in principle, if one can decide, like if you can uh, reward in some way, uh, the, like you, you can give a reward based on the policy. The problem is with these approaches, like with learning the policy is that it becomes very different, like very difficult, right? Because you not only have to optimize for your learning task, but you also are going to depend on the policy that you uh, need yeah. to learn. Open the paper. Can okay. you see my screen well? Yep. Okay. Great. Uh, 
Um, should I continue or you want yeah, to? I, I guess unless someone raises his hand or his or her hand. Um, okay, I actually have another question. Yeah, um, sure. So yeah, Beatrice, you talked about the, um, um, the WL hierarchy and um, higher order GNNs. So I'm just curious about this. It, it seems to me like uh, results in some paper have shown that going up this hierarchy and you know having higher order GNNs does not necessarily relate to like better generalization performance and everything. So yeah, I'm just curious to know what you think about this. Like why it seems like you know going to third order or uh, even in a sparse way doesn't really help that much in terms of performance. Uh, I think in general, it, first of all, it depends on the task that you you might hand you you might have. I think, for example, on the zinc molecular data set, this is not exactly true because the the um, like the target is uh, related to like it's correlated to substructure counting, which cannot be done with a non-expressive uh, message message passing neural network. So I understand it's uh, obviously it. I think like the question is that it depends. So it really depends on what is your task. Sometimes you don't need the higher expressiveness you like you're going to do just fine with message passing neural networks but for some other task you really need to be able to actually extract more feature information that is going then to help uh, while predicting okay okay thank you uh it's a great question i think in general like yeah, yeah. i want to say i think the community doesn't really have a strong answer yet uh so um there is some evidence that in many cases you if you use a more expressive message passing neural network you gain uh and also in terms of the generalization but sometimes it doesn't seem to be the case and i think one aspect is we, we don't really understand is um for example how these networks are optimized um perhaps the side order approaches need a, a you know slightly more specific uh, optimization approach rather than simply, you know, add on and, um, or maybe they require a particular learning uh, rate schedule or, or something like this. So I think these are aspects we really don't understand and I'm not sure there is enough um, work on this area, but for sure it's something very interesting. Okay, thank you so much. Of course. Um, okay, let's uh, continue. So uh, this is where we, we were. Uh, we, you know, took a look at many different uh, methods, which sometimes unwittingly uh, somehow use uh, subgraphs to enhance the expressive power of message passing neural networks. Right. Uh, we would like to unify them, and in particular, to study the, their expressive power. What we did uh, in our paper to recap is we focus on a specific family. And that we and we call this family not based on graph gene. And so let's take a look. So in terms of uh, not based uh, on graph gene, and so the the first observation is that essentially most of the um, like mo the, amongst the most popular policies, uh, such as for example ego networks, uh, which is very popular amongst all these models, uh, not marking as well, not deletion. So the really the the, the peculiarity of these uh, selection policies is that they generate subgraphs where uh, there is a, uh, a connection between the subgraph that is generated and a specific node in the original graph. Uh, in, there is essentially a one-to-one -one correspondence or a bijection. In the case, for example, of ego networks, we can always put in correspondence the ego network per se with the root of the ego network. Uh, in the case of node marking, the, of, trivially we can put in correspondence uh, the the marked subgraph with the node that is being marked, for example, right? So in general, we 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 label these nodes as root nodes. So the nodes that, in a sense, they are associated or they uh, give birth to a specific subgraph, and uh, all, all these subgraphs using the subgraph selection policies, we call them node based subgraph GNNs. And um, the focus of our work is essentially uh, on, uh, on this family. We would like to study the um, uh, expressive power of this family of subgraph genes and hopefully find a common characterization. But and we said that we wanted to do it via symmetries and equivariance. So the first step in this direction is 
was to uh, try and understand what are the symmetries of uh, bugs of subgraphs generated by node based policies. So, as a recap, so this is um, the, the symmetries of a generic bug of subgraphs, not necessarily not based, is something we studied in the previous work in, uh, in Nissan, right? And back in Nissan, we argued that the idea is you, you, you would like to have, well, you would like to model symmetries of a bug of subgraphs via two permutation symmetries. One is an external permutation, which uh, essentially acts on the subgraphs. In other words, you know the, the order of the subgraphs is not is arbitrary, so it's uh, the, we, would, we would like to have layers which are variant to permutations of subgraphs. On the other hand, we have the standard permutation of nodes in, in subgraphs, and we argued that um, whenever we per permute nodes in a subgraph, we would like to permute the nodes in all in, in all other subgraphs uh, in the same way because um, nodes in each subgraph can be traced back to original nodes, so they are aligned. So we came up with this idea of having these two permutation groups, which are related by a direct product. And uh, in a way to you know, devise layers which are equivalent to this uh, symmetry group, we uh, essentially borrowed the design principle that has have been studied in DSS. So this uh, deep sets um, uh, of symmetric elements. This is what we use to come up with the architecture uh, that we call DSS genome. But now, in the case of node-based uh, bugs of subgraphs, the situation is slightly different. So the idea is that if we have this correspondence between subgraphs and nodes, then uh, we might more accurately um, model the symmetries of this bug of node-based subgraphs with just one single permutation group. Um, these permutation groups not only permutes nodes, it also permutes subgraphs in the same way. Because again, we know that a specific subgraph is associated with a specific node. And at this point, we have exactly this symmetric group SN, which now acts on the cube tensor. Here, I'm, I'm showing this tensor where, where we represent essentially a stacking of the um, matrix representations of each subgraph. So the question now is, OK, do we have equivalent layers to this symmetry group? And um, in order to uh, answer this question, we took a little detour and studied, uh, again, uh, invariant graph networks. Invariant graph networks have, are models that have been introduced uh, in 2019. And they've been introduced originally with the idea of um, having principal uh, models to process hypergraphs. Um, these models are, in general, invariant to SN, this uh, symmetric group acting over uh, the um, uh, you know, uh, Rn to the power of k, uh, so these higher order tensors, and they are built by stacking equivariant maximal expressive linear layers, where equivariant it means equivalent to this symmetry group. Now the cool thing about these models is that they are very well characterized not only in terms of their um, the, the form of their equivariant layers, uh, and this is because you know it's we know uh, exactly what's the basis that spans. Uh, through this, you know, the, this spans the space of all uh, possible equivalent linear layers between uh, these higher order tensors. Um, at the same time, we know exactly what's the expressive power of these approaches. And previous works uh, have shown that they are exactly as expressive as KWL. You remember this higher order ger uh, generalization of the color refinement algorithm. So if we uh, consider a KIGN, we know that if, on one hand, is at least as expressive in terms of separating graphs as the KWL test, but at the same time is upper bounded by the KWL test. So if, there, if there's a pair of graphs which is not distinguished by KWL, it cannot even be distinguished by a KIGN. So now the, the thing is the following. If we put K equal to three, we have uh, that these models um, process uh, these cube tensors on which uh, one single permutation group uh, acts and the idea is that these delayed the, the you know, equivalent layers of three IGNs are exactly those layers we were looking for. So they are equivalent to the same symmetry group we, we are interested in, that is uh, the symmetry group of not base bugs of subgraphs. So from this observation, we realized that we could, in, in, in fact, um, consider three IGNs to study and characterize together uh, not base subgraph GNNs. And the first step in this direction was to take a look at the orbits that are induced by the, sim the action of the symmetry group over this cube tensor. Um, these orbits essentially um, they uh, convey a partition of this uh, tensor into uh, these uh, subsets, which we represent here with different colors. 
the interesting thing is that if we want to take a look at uh, you know the semantic of uh, these orbits, they, they, the semantic is actually meaningful. So first of all, we have that if one of these orbits, uh, so one set a subset in this partition is made up of these uh, elements in purple. And if we consider how we constructed this uh, bag of subgraphs, the, the elements in purple exactly correspond to root nodes. So all those uh, nodes which give birth to subgraphs. Whereas all the other uh, elements in the green orbit, so this diagonal plane in the cube tensor, uh, they correspond to non-root nodes. So nodes in subgraphs which are not associated directly to the subgraph uh, at hand. So we already start to have this very meaningful semantic and we can do the same also with the other orbits. So if we consider these elements in orange, it's very interesting to see they correspond exactly to the connections from root nodes. The elements in yellow, they correspond to connections towards root nodes. And all the other elements in gray, they effectively correspond to, they are hosting you know, information about the connectivity between non-root non nodes. So, this was promising, like you know, it, it was uh, it was telling that this was a good idea to use essentially three AGNs to study these objects and provide a common characterization. And in particular, we empowered by this uh, the result of this observation, we start we tried to um, uh, use three AGN layers to simulate subgraph GNNs by means of the equivalent of operations that uh, constitute these layers. So it's just as a, a small, uh, essentially, um, as, a, as a small detour, three AGN layers, as I was saying, they are well, very well characterized. And people have shown how you can write uh, one uh, three AGN layer as a summation of, actually, as a linear combination of pooling broadcasting operations between the elements of these orbits. So this is what we try to do. We try to use these pooling broadcasting uh, operations to recover uh, on one hand, we need to recover subgraph selection policies, which are, you know, which is the first step to uh, in in a, in a subgraph GNN architecture is the first module. On the other hand, we wanted to um, um, simulate the functioning of the encoders of the subgraph GNN encoders, which process these bags. And uh, the first Fabrizio, why do you now say that the permutations have meaningful? Um, yeah, that the permutations are meaningful or have meaningful semantic. Yeah, I don't so know, you're saying that the orbits induced yeah. have meaningful semantics and that, that's so what you're showing. And okay, I see. So yeah, essentially um, intuitively orbits are, um, you know, they, they form up, they, uh, they are these sets of uh, elements uh, where um, they are, we, we can think of, it, of them as you know these elements could not um, can only stay in in, this, in the same set uh, when a permutation is acting on the on this overall object. So if we permute this uh, cube tensor the way we would like to permute it, that is with just one single permutation group uh, with diagonal action, essentially one uh, purple element cannot go into the green or yellow or gray or orange that it will always stay within the set of purple elements. And this is the same for all the others. So if we take a green element, it will, when it will, you know, in, irrespective of the permutation we apply, it will always stay within the set of green elements. This is the idea of orbits. And uh, so it's interesting to see that they correspond to something which is meaningful in terms of how we interpret subgraph GNNs. Um, so if so we take one one green guy and apply all permutations, then we reach all other green guys, but nothing else. Exactly, exactly. And it it was uh, reassuring on one hand, but also in interesting and promising on the other hand to notice that uh, all green uh, elements they have a common uh, you know semantic that is they are exactly those nodes which do not uh, generate the subgraph. Um, so not the, they are essentially non-root nodes. Whereas root nodes, those which are associated to specific subgraphs, for example, roots in ego networks or marked nodes in, mar in not marking policies, they are all exactly uh, corresponding to this uh, powerful subset and nothing else. So we have a very crisp uh, and meaningful uh, partitioning of this, um, of this um, object that we want to process essentially yeah. with three AGN layers. 
And so, yes, yeah, so essentially the idea was to try and use three agent layers to uh, recover the functioning of these models. And this is something we, we managed to do. So if one in the first lemma, we showed that three AGN layers can implement node-based policies. So it, in order to see this intuitively, for example, if we want to delete, to do node deletion, what we want to do is we want to disconnect root nodes from the rest of the, sub, of the graph, right? And in order to do this, since we have this very precise characterization, we know that connections towards and from root nodes are exactly in those uh, yellow and orange orbits, we simply have to put these elements to zero to disconnect that. And this can be done with pulling with the standard you know, set of pulling broadcasting operations of 3 and layers. Or if you want to mark root nodes, we know where they are. We know that root nodes are exactly in the first uh, orbit in this uh, diagonal, main diagonal in the cube tensor. So what we need to do is we want to concatenate a mark to these elements and uh, and not to the others, uh, and you know, in by more sophisticated operations, but still of this in this period, we can also recover ego networks of any depth. And um, this is on one end. On the other hand, we can also show that we are able to implement subgraph chain and layers. Um, so, you know, in many cases, simply we need to implement message passing independently on each subgraph. But in some cases, as we saw, for example, some of these. Uh, architectures, we have some sharing of information between subgraphs, right? But still, this is something we can do via the equivalent operations of three IGN layers. And just to, but yeah, just to give an understanding of how pooling broadcasting can be used to recover message passing on each subgraph independently, the, like the idea is you essentially first take the elements in the purple and green orbits, you broadcast them towards all, all the other orbits in this uh, node pairs. Uh, then you would like to probably, uh, since message passing is local, you would like to only retain those messages from neighbors. So what you can do is you can use dense layers uh, to uh, sparsify this information, these messages in a way to uh, convey the actual connectivity of this graph. And then once you have sparsified these messages, you can pull them together horizontally and use this aggregated information to update the representation of the, or the elements in the purple and green orbit, which is those are the orbits where um, the node representations across subgraphs are stored. And uh, with these lemmas, then, sorry. Um, yes, uh, I think there's a problem with the slide. Uh, no, okay. Yeah, so uh, given that we proved this uh, intuition, then um, the idea was that we can um, show that three IGNs upper bounds of graph GNNs in their expressive power. And since, as, as I was anticipating, three IGNs are also upper bounded by three WL, and then we get for free an upper bound on the, well, not really for free, but we get an upper bound on the expressive power of not base of graph GNNs. And this upper bound is exactly three WL. So whenever you have a not base policy and uh, you, uh, and the, the encoders that have been proposed in this whole uh, set of uh, concurrent approaches, you know that you will, will never go beyond 3WL in terms of distinguishing uh, isomorphic graphs. And so we place uh, node base of GNNs in between 1WL and 3WL, or also if you wish, between GIN and 3 IGNs. Um, of course, you know, this doesn't really tell us much on the lower bound in the sense that we know that, well, you know, they are strictly more expressive than the 1WL, these models. They are upper bounded by 3WL, but we don't know if there's still gap between them and 3WL. Maybe some of these models are already 3WL. They might not be the case. Um, it might not be the case. Uh, but this is something that we consider in the second part of the work. And we said, okay, since we know the three agents upper bound these models and, and they can simulate these models, then perhaps we can use the set of three IGN operations to maybe the you know devise new subgraph GNNs uh, with not based policies. And perhaps we can even gain expressive power. So we can explore this uh, inter you know this um, this gap between not based subgraph GNNs and, and 3 WL. Um, and just to give an intuition why this would be a sensible thing to do. Um, this slide is a bit, um, I, I appreciate it. it's a bit uh, complicated, but I want to just give you the gist. If we consider the symmetry groups to which uh, DSGNN or DSSGNN are equivalent to, um, 
so we know that uh, in, the, in the case of the SGNN is the breadth product between two symmetry groups. So here I'm showing essentially one specific element in this group. Say uh, one element in this group it can, for example, you know, take the first subgraph and um, swap the first and the third node, right? So here we are showing it in this, uh, like the, the, the cube tensor after the action of this uh, element of the group. So as you can see, the first and third nodes are swapped in the first subgraph. And in the case of, and, and, and this GNN is equivalent to uh, these actions. Um, so yeah, uh, the, in the case of DSS GNN, so we claimed, you know, in, in our previous paper that the direct prod, the, uh, you know, DSS GNN in, in principle subsumes DSS GNN. And this is because the direct product, which is the group to which DSS GNN is equivalent to, is strictly is stricter than the breadth product. And this is because, for example, you know, here we're showing um, uh, one, uh, an element in this um, um, direct product between the two uh, permutation groups. The idea is, as we have alignment between nodes, whenever we want to swap the first node with the third node, we have to do this in all subgraphs jointly, right? So G2, this action, um, is in the, you know, the set of possible permutations in the direct product, but, uh, and is also in the, um, in the, you know, in the, in the larger read product. But the other uh, way around is not, uh, is not true in the sense that G1, so the action such that we only permute the first and the third node is not actually in the direct product. So this is a permutation so to say that is not allowed. And the SSGNN is not equivalent to these permutations. Um, but still, see, and, and because of this reason, since uh, it is equivalent, must be equivalent to a smaller set of uh, um, uh, permutations, it is, le it is less constrained in the, in the form of the layers, in the way sharing patterns of the layers. And if we want to push this argument farther, now that we have not based subgraph GNNs, we know that essentially we have just one single permutation group. So we are not allowed to uh, simply uh, swap the first node with the third in the first subgraph. We're not even allowed to, to swap the first node and the third node in all subgraphs at the same time. Whenever we, we swap the first and the third node, we also need to swap the first subgraph with the third subgraph. And this, even, this group is even smaller. And IGNs are equivalent to this group. And since they are equivalent to an even smaller set of permutations, therefore the layers are less constrained. So if you're able to explore this region in between DSS, GNN, and IGN, perhaps we can you know, come up with an architecture which is slightly or significantly more expressive than other not based subgraph GNNs, even though we know that it will be always simulated by a, an IGN. So let's uh, recap. This is the idea, right? So we have a group inclusion which looks like this. So we know that the symmetry group of DSS GNN or other subgraph GNNs is the direct product between these two symmetries. And this contains the um, one single permutation symmetry acting on the cube tensor. So in terms of function space, this is exactly the inverse. So we know that since three IGNs are need to be equivalent to a smaller set of permutations, so the, the layers are less constrained. And, if, and we are essentially, um, we have space to design more powerful architecture. The problem with three IGNs, if we would like to use them to design new subgraph GNNs, is that this is not really practical because essentially the way these layers are constructed is by means of 203 atomic operations, which are linearly combined together. So the space is large. And at the same time, the computation is dense, and we know, and the computational complexity in terms of space complexity is cubic, um, which is not ideal. Right. So we tried to find that compromise. We wanted to um, have a framework, which is not three IGNs because we know it's a bit vast to explore, but a framework which still, you know, covers all previously proposed subgraph GNNs while still giving us uh, space to explore something new. And the, the idea behind our approach was is the following. In standard node based subgraph GNNs, at the end of the day, what we do is we update the representation of nodes. We don't really update representation of edges, right? And as per the discussions we had before, representations of nodes are those are only in these two orbits, in the sparkle and green one. 
So the, they are not in the other or in, so in the rest of the tensor, let's say, we only find information about connectivity. So if you only want to update node representations, we can as well uh, focus in particular on this subtensor. And the interesting thing about this subtensor is that if you think about it, it abides by the same same symmetries of two IGNs. So not three IGNs, but two IGNs, because essentially we have um, a sing single permutation group acting over the um, uh, the matrix, um, well, or the tensor, let's say, R n to the power two. So the idea would be we could borrow the design space from two IGNs, which is smaller. We can uh, slightly extend it to include sparse pooling operations because if this is what we want to recover it's sparse message passing. And what so about two IGNs uh, quickly. So okay, these models uh, essentially they update on and off diagonal terms in this matrix, with a uh, you know by means of a linear combination of different terms, including pooling. Uh, so uh, including terms which come from uh, pulling some of these elements in the matrix. But the interesting thing about these layers is that they update on and off diagonal terms in the matrix by a distinct set of uh, parameters. Now, maybe mm, this would help if we take a look more visually, what happens is that we have this matrix. We Here we have, uh, we are showing how off diagonal terms and on diagonal terms are updated. Each of these, uh, we have a different color which um, convey the fact that we are using a specific different parameter for that particular element in the update equation. Whenever we have more than one element sharing the same color, we pull these elements together. So we can you know, visually represent two IGNs like this. So in our case, what happens is that, first of all, we don't really have nodes on rows, we have subgraphs, right? So in a sense, the interpretation is different, although the operations would essentially be the same. The other thing is we would like, as I was saying, to have local pooling operation, not just global pooling operation. So here we show this with these little triangles. The idea is that we can also pool according to the subgraph connectivity we have at hand. Um, and this is convenient to recover message passing. So we have this framework, which essentially applies to IGN operation, operations on the subtensor where, where node representations are stored and it's slightly extended to also have sparse uh, pooling. And this, uh, although this represents a subspace of the overall space of three IGN uh, operations, this is still expressive enough in the sense that we managed to show in our paper that we can recover essentially all previously proposed subgraph chain and layers uh, within, with it. And here we are showing this visually. Uh, so by pattern matching, you can see that essentially the operations that are used in other subgraph GNNs to update uh, representations of nodes across subgraphs, uh, they are a subset of the overall set of operations we have in this framework. So this framework is large enough to cover them, but it's also uh, there's also something in, in rem, rem, which remains to be explored. And one step towards exploring the space is, um, is well, essentially uh, SUN. SUN is a, net, is a model that we designed to um, uh, as an instantiation of this framework, which um, still, uh, so it covers, it captures all previously proposed GNNs, but we decided to minimally extend them. And this minimal extension is done in the spirit of two IGNs. So now that we know what's exactly the uh, symmetry group, how this layer, equivalent layers should be, um, uh, should be designed, we know that, for example, we can also have a distinct set of parameters to update on diagonal terms in this subtensor. And What's interesting about this is that now we know what's the meaning of these. So we know that on diagonal terms are uh, root nodes and off diagonal terms are non root nodes. So this whole framework is prescribing us to use a distinct set of parameters to update the two, uh, uh, the two, node, the two classes of nodes across subgraphs. And experimentally, we observed that this model uh, effectively uh, performs uh, very well. Um, so these are uh, results on the MOLHIB molecular benchmark, where the task is to predict the um, uh, capacity of um, small uh, chemical compounds to inhibit the replication of, of the HIV. And um, we not only we uh, performed uh, slightly better than other subgraph GNNs. We also approached uh, closely uh, other methods, which include information about molecular rings, uh, something which uh, to which SUN is completely agnostic to. We, here we're using only a 
an agnostic eco network policy with marking of uh, routes, for example. And uh, one last set of experiments before we wrap up, uh, we also explored uh, the generalization uh, ability of Sun in low data regimes. So what we are showing in this plot is essentially the test performance of Sun for uh, slide, you know, for an increasing uh, size of training examples used to fit these models. And as you can see, uh, Sun generalizes very well in low data regimes. Uh, this is a, a synthetic benchmark, which is about counting the number of four cycles in, in small graphs. And uh, just to give an, an understanding, so with um, with Sun, we can get the same performance we would get with a standard message passing neural network with around 200 samples. So with just 200 training examples, we would get the same performance and amping and we'll get a regime. Whereas uh, with uh, around one third of the data, we could get to the same performance that DSS GNN uh, can get at regime. So these results were very interesting and somehow this proved our uh, concern that this um, uh, less constrained layers could have hard time generalizing. Uh, so to conclude, I'm probably out of time also, uh, apolog I apologize. Uh, so we use symmetry analysis to study node based of graph GNNs, and we found an upper bound in the expressive power of, for this class of models. We introduced a uh, design space uh, for uh, new layers unifying previous approaches. And I, we hope that this will give cues for new research directions in expressive GNNs. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and to discuss also um, future um, works. Thank you. One, yeah, thank you. And now one other contribution is that it just makes the whole subgraph GNN space super clear and explains everything very nicely. Yeah. Uh, but I guess maybe that falls under introduce a design space. Um, okay, then Omar, do you have, or Omar, do you have another question? Yes, uh, just another question. So I was wondering, um, what about the retard GNN? What, have you got some results for this model and how how does it train or is it too expressive? Um, I, I'm curious. Yeah, so RAIN2, this uh, result at uh, GNs, so we proved in the paper that as we expect, uh, they cannot go beyond 3WL in expressive power. So effectively this model is a subset of three IGNs um so we know that it still has this upper bound um i would we have not implemented the all set of operations in this framework this could be done um, um yeah um this could be done this could be done um i i think um, it's the its value is more in giving you a set of i ideas, principled ideas on how to choose new operations. For example, one thing we haven't discussed is that um, one of the operations prescribed by this RAIN2 framework would be to also use the transpose, which is something a bit exotic and you would not think about it, but this is part of the set of operations. So with the transpose, I mean that in principle, you would also have to take into account those um, uh, you know, figures in this update equations such that when you update the representation of nodes, uh, say i in subgraph k, you need to take into account the representation of node k in subgraph i. Um, so this is, for example, one operation which is a bit exotic. It's part of the framework. In some cases, this might be useful, or maybe if it would be cool to use this maybe in the case where we would expect um, the graph to disconnect based on some policy. So in this case, we, we still ensure flow of information uh, across these components, for example. Um, yeah, uh, or maybe in, in tasks which are more pairwise, this could be interesting to capture this information in a more coupled manner. So yeah, this is what I wanted to convey, the fact that we have a set of operations that could be explored. But yeah, in principle, one can also go flat out and use them all and perhaps try to infer the weight of each of these uh, with other with attribution methods or ablation studies or even learn them with reinforcement learning or something like this. 
Thank you, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful work. It's nice. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, then also like a little bit um, bringing in some skepticism, so to say, uh, like, do you think this is really like, you say we open up new new directions or yeah new research directions for expressive DNNs. Um, uh, how interesting do you think are the expressive is the expressive DNN direction still? Is the space sufficiently exploited, and we should move on to generalization? And... Yeah. So in general, I think that it's already a good time to move to generalization. Uh, so we haven't solved the, you know, we haven't completely characterized the space of provably expressive GNNs, but nevertheless, I think it's already time to start moving to generalization. And people have already started to do that uh, in some cases. It's not that, uh, it's, it's, a, it's much harder than studying expressive power. So I think it will take more time and probably more, um, you know, and probably deeper work to really move forward in this direction. On the other hand, um, I think there's still more than, I think that the, the probably expressive um, direction is not uh, dead yet in the sense that I think it's, we still have to get a better understanding of uh, First, what are other ways to measure expressive power, which might be more insightful? Like distinguishing graphs is my it's is very convenient to use as a measure because we we have a, a hierarchies, we, we know what it means, it's easy to prove theorems. But on the other hand, this is not what we really care in practice. So even to mm -hmm. just come up with new measures, I think it's something very cool. And then to reinterpret all the, uh, the architectures that have been proposed in the past. In, by you know in in view of new measures of expressive power i think this would be very valuable and to probably also explore some approaches like clever approaches in in in, in the graph gnn spaces i think would be cool for example now that we have this upper bound we know that if you want to if in, on a certain specific task we really need to go beyond three uh, wl because perhaps we need to capture substructures which we know cannot be captured by 3WL, then we know that for sure we need to either get a selection policy which is not, not based or, or or both, or we need to ask a, you know, a, a base encoder which is not an MPNN. So all these methods, I had this maybe the untold assumption of the presentation, this all these methods use a standard message passing base encoder, but uh, perhaps they can also use uh, more expressive base encoders. So this MPNN block yeah. that we showed in the figures, that it can be replaced with, in turn, more expressive uh, MPNN. So in this sense, I think that there are cues for new directions because people could now, now are aware of what's required to go beyond if this is required or not. Yeah, my, my criticism is always just uh, that graphs are graph learning tasks are so diverse and there are so many different graphs and that maybe sometimes um, it makes more sense to look at the specific types of graphs that we're interested in and instead of trying to build generally better methods uh, but yeah i mean that's just one thing uh, but you also said uh, looking at expressiveness from different sorts of views what do you think or looking at other um, sorts of expressiveness characterizations than just distinguishing non-isomorphic graphs um, what do you think about spy connectivity yeah for example this is one example uh, what i was trying to say is yeah exactly like this would be one first step in this direction and I think these works are very valuable because they give us a better understanding of models that have been proposed in the past and whenever you get something more uh, it's always uh, in terms of understanding it's always welcome so this could be an idea yeah uh, maybe there will be others in the future maybe people will figure out that 
there are specific substructures you can count or you cannot count or maybe other graph properties that you can detect and with other with some methods but not with others so yeah for sure i, I just got worried because you said the uh, expressiveness uh, st studying expressiveness is not dead yet so like soon it will be that <laughs> um, I, I hope not uh, there's exciting works like this this or like the biconnectivity stuff going on but yeah anyway dom what's your question your point hey uh thanks a lot fabrizio and beatrice for for this great talk i'm almost a, always a fan of, of this uh line of work about expressive gnns and uh yeah you've proposed so many of them and it's nice to to see a framework that, that generalizes everything uh it's super cool um yeah so i i will uh um would like to to ask the question uh, regarding for example um other lines of work regarding the expressivity of gnns and uh, how do you think like th this compares to it and what, what would be the advantage? Uh, for example, there has been many works on integrating like positional and structural encoding into graphs and then using weakly expressive GNNs. Um, many of these works uh, were, were led by, by myself, so there's a bit of a bias here. <laughs> so the question is um, how, like why uh, would you want to change completely the graph neural network architect the graph neural network layer instead of just taking the subgraphs that you find trying to give an id associated to these subgraphs and use this as a structural encoding and then combine this uh, with just a weak mpnn um, because there there has been like many work showing that for example, just uh, doing the diagonal of the random walk. Um, this was led by VJ Duvedi uh, and uh, reused by myself with lots of success. Just take the diagonal of the random walk matrix a uh, different number of steps. And then it becomes super easy to count the number of uh, three cycles and five cycles and seven cycles and nine cycles, basically every odd number of cycles becomes super easy to count. I'm not sure about the uh, the even cycles, but um, would there be a way to uh, reframe this work to generate positional encoding or structural encoding? And if not, if you think that having an expressive layer at every layer uh, has a, a better advantage than pre-generating position and using weak GNNs. I'm not sure if my question is clear. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, Patricia, you want to take? Uh... I, I wanted to add like maybe one thing. So um, I understand your point and it makes a lot of sense, but I also want to point out that uh, for some of the subgraph GNNs that we presented, the layers were not really more expressive. They were maybe like simple message passing uh, neural networks, right? So it, also in that case, it's like weak GNNs that were applied and the expressive power gain was uh, due to the fact that uh, there were these uh, policies that could uh, give us the subgraphs that were then passed through like simple layers. So I think it depends what which subgraph GNNs we're going to use in order, like, so, because like, if we use some of them, that's like also uh, along these lines of using a weak model, just that it is equipped by some information that comes from the subgraphs. Then uh, uh, related to maybe like, uh, if we can obtain some sort of encoding, like uh, that then can be used. Uh, I, I'm not sure, I mean, potentially, maybe. Uh, but what we found advantageous was exactly like studying the, the symmetry groups. Uh, and then we took actually a very different route then because we studied the, the symmetry group and then we designed uh, layers that were equivalent to the symmetry groups. So, so I guess uh, we, yeah, we had uh, like, we, we took a different path from this, um, but why not? Um. Yeah, maybe what I would add is, um, first of all, I don't think that uh, 
some GraphGen ends in general are the best way at the moment to uh, for a group of express GN ends, and we should only focus on them. No, I think um, they have good advantages with respect to other models, uh, in particular with respect to higher order GN ends because they are more tractable and they have a better inductive bias. Uh, they, I think, they have advantages with respect to models based on random features because they are covariant. So typically they tend to generalize better, they have less variance. Um, but for example, yeah, I, I believe it, it's actually a good point. There are methods which are based on uh, um, providing nodes with IDs, which are not necessarily run, random, based on random features, and they actually uh, retain some pro form of topological information, like for example, the works you explored, the mix, or you can use uh, Laplacian encodings, random walks, uh, random walk encodings. So I think probably these two subgraph chain ends on one end and no models based on um, these clever uh, node IDs would probably be the best bet going forward to both. The interesting thing is to try and study a little bit more um, characterize a little bit more these methods based on position encodings because I think uh, I have the intuition that, uh, but maybe I'm wrong, but my impression is that it's as it was the state of affairs uh, in subgraph genes up to a few months ago, that is, you prove that you can get more expressive than standard MPNNs, but it's not clear if there's an upper bound. Um, and essentially, if there is a limitation in, in what you can capture. And to have to study these would be very valuable for me in general. And uh, perhaps at some point, if one is able to get a better characterization of these methods, then it might be also possible to even study them together and maybe find connections between subgraph GNNs on one end and these methods on the other hand. Um, so I believe we're still missing some pieces, but all in all, it will be also exciting to try and um, study the relation between the two. There might be uh, relations. And one thing I, I noticed, for example, is that maybe we, is, I wouldn't really necessarily um, use subgraph GNNs to obtain position encodings, but somehow what I would say is they use a form of weak encoding of uh, position encoding. Uh, so what you were mentioning about giving an idea of what's the idea of the subgraph. This is more or less what's done when you use node marking policies because essentially you're marking exactly only one node per subgraph and the other nodes will, will compute the representations in a way that is conditioned on the fact that they are in that subgraph with respect to that specific node. So there is a form of identification, but in subgraph genome is weak, uh, and the fact that it's weak uh, allows to keep uh, somehow uh, equivariance uh, and uh, to, to get to keep this strong inductive bias. Um, if you want to get more uh, powerful identification mechanism, one would naturally go with the higher order policies. So you instead of marking one node, you mark two nodes at a time, or stuff like this. The problem with this approach is that the, the size of the bug increases. So there's, yeah, uh, but there are, there's space, I think there for, for new models. For example, there's a nice new approach, which essentially propose uh, an higher order policy, which is, it seems to be more suited to count cycles and with respect to, for example, simple node marking. And the way one you does that is you extract an ego network and then you mark Two nodes at a time, based on the fact that you know the root, and also like neighbors, uh, like you mark essentially one neighbor at a time, one immediate neighbor, something like this, along these lines. So this is like a clever higher order policy, which is specifically tied uh, to um, detection of cycles, for example. So there's always a form of identification. It's a matter of trying to reconcile these two. I think it would be very cool. Yeah. Next uh, time we're going to see you. Uh, in this reading group, like we're going to present understanding and extending <laughs> this method, <laughs> like positional encoding and subgraph GNN. Okay, yeah. that, sure. that'd be great. That'd be great. Is this uh, actually something that you're planning uh, to do, or? Well, I mean, at the moment we're not no, working not on this. But, uh, we're not. Uh, really. Yeah.
So, uh, no, it's very interesting. Like uh, one thing uh, I would like to see also, like from, from this paper, for example, if you take this uh, sun layer and instead of using like eight sun layers, what if you use only one or two sun layers and then you uh, add MPNN layers afterwards? Um, would you retrieve the same expressivity? Um, but in general, I, I really like uh, how like the, the, the work is uh, like you, you have a strong analysis of the theoretical expressivity of these, this network compared to, to the work that's done um, in positional encodings, for example. And I think that's one of the big, big advantage of these methods. And as you mentioned, like maybe one day they will be reconciled or someone uh, will do better theoretical analysis on, on the other side. Um, but in some sense, I, as you said, I don't think one or the other is the, the final solution. Uh, and uh, they, they both have like their, their, their own merit if we can bring them together, it would be very nice. Cool. <laughs> then uh, I think there was a question at some point whether like what happens if we have message passing layers after some layers, something like this. You asked this, uh, Dominique. Yeah. Um, so okay. Um, I think this is more related to the lower bound, which is something we haven't been able to approach yet. So, because I mean, in terms of the upper bound, the upper bound wouldn't change. Um, it, if you stack MPN and layers after some layers, you will not get more expressive power because some layers essentially um, subsume MPN and layers. So it will always be upper bounded by 3WL. Um, the question is whether the lower bound uh, gets even lower, that is, um, I, I guess you would still be, be, I suppose you would still be more than one WL. The question if, is whether these MPN layers will bring you, uh, for example, um, closer to one WL than other subgraph genes are, for example. And this is something which is not clear at the moment. Like maybe to very quickly, like if you take a look at this, plot and we take a look at the, exper the, the results of the regime. This is something that it's interesting because it seems like there is a stratification of uh, performance with, you know, when we take a look on the class of subgraph GNN. So some of them seem to be more uh, like to be better than others. Then this would suggest that perhaps, and I think this would be interesting to study, perhaps, you know, there is um, a finer uh, characterization here in between. So in between, not, you know, in the space between one and three WL. Um, and if maybe if you use MPN and layers, you would move towards the left part of this uh, line. But uh, yeah, uh, it's something that we haven't started. So I won't be able to say anything, uh, uh, yeah, uh, precise or rigorous now. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, for sure, you don't increase expressivity. Do you decrease it? And if so, by how much is uh, the big question? Yeah. Okay, one, one of the issue uh, is that you, you use a lot of uh, molecular data set to evaluate the expressivity and molecular data set. Uh, I don't think they will ever require three WL. I think one WL is, is enough. Um, so from an empirical standpoint, it's difficult to see like uh, does expressivity actually decrease or not because you don't care if it goes from uh, two WL to one and a half WL as long as you're more than one, yeah. you're, you're good, right? So that's a that's a big question. Yeah, yeah, and I think it will open also, like, th this is an important observation. The question is, for example, if you care about modeling molecules, maybe it's more interesting rather than going beyond w one, 3 WL, it would be more interesting to study a finer characterization of what's happening in between 1 and 3, and uh, if there are some properties you can detect that some models in this region and some others you cannot, this will be very valuable, for example. Uh, 
uh, in uh, in for molecular modeling. Good. The, I think the manner is sufficiently uh, discussed. Uh, Fabrizio, uh, yeah, let's do the, the clap by Dom. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation and the paper. As Omar said, it's a very nice work. And uh, Omar, and um, any last words, anything you want to, uh, to say to finish the day? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You can also say something. I just wanted to say uh, this project uh, started from uh, essentially the Logan Mel Summer School. Um, so Beatrice and I met there and we met a guy there last year. Uh, and it's been great so far, like to get these connections. And Beatrice and I have been working for one year together very nicely and with a lot of fun. Um, so I invite I would invite people and especially early stage PhD students to apply for next, you know, next editions of the summer school. Because it's a nice opportunity. Um, Beatrice has that already captured what you wanted to say. No, like what I wanted to say is that we are going to host a tutorial on expressive uh, expressive uh, GNMs at uh, the log uh, conference. So we would be happy to have you all.